it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Strange Cases of a Philadelphia Cop Hey guys, so um, I've decided to put some of my weirdest cases out there for the world to see. The goal? To show you just how weird and curious the world you live in truly is. I'm going to start with my weirdest one yet. I'll say one thing. Keep five bucks on you at all times. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. A ten spot might be even better though. Right. Let's begin with The House. My name's Dan Josephson, and I've been a cop in Philadelphia for about four years now. I thoroughly enjoy my job, but in a year of 365 days, 90% of those are pretty great. But at least once or twice a year, there's some strangeness I'm involved in. Didn't always used to be like this. Well, up until a couple of years ago, I never once believed in anything supernatural. Maybe I shouldn't say supernatural, because that's not what she called it. Well, she told me after she'd saved me from a dogman hybrid thing. That, if it exists, then it's natural. If it flies, it's natural, even if I can't see that its wings are visible. If it walks, it's natural. If you could test it, it's a natural thing, no matter how weird it seemed. Two years ago, she saved me from one of those natural things, as it tried to eat me to death. She explained to me that she wasn't some Buffy the Vampire Slayer type. I just happened to get lucky that she was in the area. But that it worked out for the best because she needed somebody on the police force to be aware of what was going on in Philly. So I called my chief and a few other superiors. She needed to show them the underbelly of the city. Well, the whole world. It took one showing to get them to believe her. But this sucked for me, though, as whenever weird shit happened, they called me, and I had to call her if she was in town, which she often wasn't. The thing that gave me a bit of a leg up was her burning a mark on my upper arm. It gave me some protection from the shitty things in the dark, and sometimes in the light. We worked together on a few cases, including one where she lost a friend and needed to set things right. I asked her, well, if she wasn't a Buffy type, what exactly did she do? She said in a matter-of-fact way that she did three things. Collected, protected, and erased things. It was safer if I didn't know the rest. And now I needed her for all those functions. For the past month, there had been a series of people going missing from the Overbrook area of town. People going missing in a city this large isn't new. But all going missing on the same block was weird. It was all around a single house on Woodbine, near 66. The first was a kid on the way home from school. Neighbours said the kid went in after being asked to come and help a lady on the floor. The next was a painter who'd been called for a job. A plumber to fix a leak in the basement. A window replacer to fix several cracked window panes. A couple of men who went through the home's yard and never came out the back. There were several others and it caught the attention of the local media. As it closed in on Halloween, the incidents ticked up. There was something odd about the house on Woodbine. Most homes in Philly are row house types, where each home is basically a townhouse or brownstone. But in some of the newer or less population-dense areas, some places had the standard house types. Large front and back yards built on city blocks. Oh, I haven't worked a Halloween in three years. <laughs> that was my day. Halloween was my Christmas. I appreciated being on call instead of on duty, so if I was called, then it had to be important. I made it to the house and decided to look around as the neighbours looked on as people got ready for trick-or-treating. The chief didn't want anybody going near that house tonight and not coming back out. It was a decent-looking place, large porch, gabled overhangs, gothic pillars, large paned windows, all the usual. Nothing looked off about the place. As I got out of my cruiser and got closer, my upper arm felt hot. When I backed away, it cooled again. I walked closer, and the heat returned. I rolled up my sleeves to check, and I watched the mark light up as I neared the home. Okay, this place looked normal, but obviously wasn't. She'd always told me that when that thing tried to eat me, I 
had the taint now, which meant that if I somehow survived with help or on my own, others like it and her could smell it on people like me. It was like a pheromone. Uh, something might not happen ever, or something could if it felt like it. But her mark would not only alert me to others like her, but also protect me from those things. I picked up the police tape and cordoned off the house. And then I grabbed my cell. Hey, Dan, what's up? Abby, I think I'm at a haunted house. You interested? I asked. And without missing a beat, sure, give me the address and I'll head over. Well, relief washed over me. But as I looked at the house again, I swear the two front windows glowered at me in anger. Now we'll continue with a very strange friend of mine, Abigail. I waited for Abigail. She lived near the uni, the University of Penn College, so it took her a while to get my side with the traffic. She also told me she had to pick up some weird chick. Now, well, Abby's weird, so I have no idea how weird this other chick was going to be. As the sun began to go down... I noticed the house's glowering gaze seemed to follow me as I moved around the tape, but the people noticing me didn't seem to notice anything strange. And I think that's how the house was able to convince people it was safe. It just looked like a damn house, nothing creepy or odd, just a house. Now, imagine a mailman delivering a package. She knocks on the door and hears, Come on in, you can leave the package on the table. And then it's bye-bye mailman. At least, that's how I see it. Abby eventually pulled up in her car with the other chick that she called weird. She looked okay to me. Nothing overly strange. She wasn't some weird goth or trippy hippie girl. She just had on jeans, a white shirt, and a light jacket underneath. Hey, Abby, what's up? Took you a while to get here. Traffic bad? I asked her. No, Michelle here thinks she's still sleeping, and this is all a dream, so I had to convince her to wake up and go to the bathroom, put some clothes on. Michelle, this is Dan. Dan, Michelle. Abby said to me as she sat on the car's hood. I noticed that I could be the cat that she always talked about. It's never a good thing to look at, honestly. And then I noticed what could be the cat that she was always talking about. Well, it was never a good thing to look at, honestly. Half fur with a half skull head and the ribs of its gut sticking out. I shuddered whenever I saw it. But Cat, oh, that was her cat's name, was never aggressive and seemed to be a feline version of the girl Michelle, just here and bored looking. Hey, Michelle, I'm Dan, I said as she took my hand and shook it. Hi, Dan. Question. Will you be haunting my dreams too? She asked with sincerity. Uh, probably not. I don't think this is a dream. Not me, her, the cat thing, uh, or this neighborhood. But if it helps you, I'm okay with that. I told her. Cool beans. So, what's going on here? She asked. And that's when Abby stepped forward. So, what's up? You guys think this house is legit haunted? She asked me. Yeah, there's been at least ten people seen in or around this place, and never seen again. Just missing, nothing else. No blood, no guts, no crime, just poof, gone, I said, doing the explosion thing with my hands. Hmm, she said, looking at the house. Michelle, you notice anything odd about the place? Abby asked her. Well, I can't lie, Michelle was cute. I have a thing for Aquafina, and she reminded me of her, just taller. Michelle walked forward and under the tape. She went to the front of the house and stared for a few minutes. The cat thing went next to her, wagging its tail. She your apprentice or something? She gonna be the next you? I asked. No, I was asked to find her and take her with me on a few assignments, but I have no idea what the um, people I work for want with her. So I make sure I show her the ropes just in case. It's just weird how she thinks this is a dream. I guess it's her way to cope with all the shit she's seen so far. Abigail shrugged. Michelle checked down the alley, then back to the front. 
Finally, she nodded her head and walked back to us as Abby crossed her arms, waiting for the report. I don't think it's haunted. I think it's possessed, maybe, Michelle said as the cat thing jumped on the car's hood and sat next to Abby. How so? Well, the windows on the front porch just frowned at me, and towards the bottom, the lights inside seemed to glow to a pinch and then relax. When I looked in the alley, the bay window sort of wiggled like an ear twitch. An ear twitch? On a house? I said incredulously. Yep, Michelle said, adding, I noticed the base of the house kind of shift a bit when I leaned in. Kind of like it wanted to bend in on me. Good job, Michelle, Abby said. I need you to go to the alley and keep an eye on the bay window for me. Cat, I need you to go to the other side of the house and keep an eye out on the other window. Anything I can do to help? I asked her. Yeah, stay behind the police tape, Abby said with a giggle. So, what's the plan? If the house is possessed, should we call a priest or a shaman or something? Oh, Dan, they wouldn't be able to help. Probably just get killed feeding this thing, Abby said, stretching. Okay, so, um, again, what's the plan? Well, I'm going to go knock on the front door, see what happens. Then I'll check the handle. If it's locked, I'm breaking in. If it's not, I'm walking in. Then I'll close the door and wait, she said, watching her two companions walk around to the sides of the house. Well, you're an ardent, curious girl, Ms. Mitchell. You're pretty damn weird, too, I stated emphatically with a smile. She smiled in return and walked up to the house, and that's when I noticed a few people forming near the police tape. I had a couple of stragglers here and there asking what was happening. Now, given Philadelphia's history, they were probably expecting a bomb to get dropped or something. But I just told them to stand back and get out of the way. Abigail walked up to the door and then turned to look at me. She smiled and I noticed her eyes had that fiery amber glow to them. She was smiling, but she took this seriously. She not once. Nothing. She waited and knocked again. Nothing. Then I heard a click. Abby's head dropped and she shook it side to side. I watched as she grabbed the handle and put her hand on the door. Then I heard a snap and a crack. The house's windows seemed to widen as if in shock. And then Abby walked into the house. And then the craziest shit happened. You know how when you go to a restaurant or a fast food spot, you order your food and sit down to eat it? It tastes good, but it just doesn't sit right. You drink something hoping it goes down, but it doesn't. Your body heaves a little, your eyes flicker or widen as you feel the bile rising, the vomit coming, and then the explosion happens. Well, Abigail was in the house for maybe 30 or 40 seconds tops. The door flew open and Abigail came flying out of the house, over the pavement and onto the street. Holy shit! I cried out as I watched her fly over me and land on the street hard. She rolled over a couple of times and stopped on her back, arms splayed out to her sides. I rushed over to her as the cat thing and Michelle looked but stayed where they were. As I got closer, she coughed as the crowd grew and people looked on. Then I heard a giggle and then a laugh. She sat up and shook her head. Oh, dude, you all right? What the hell was that? I asked her as I helped her to stand. I'm good, she said, laughing some more. What's so funny? You just got kicked out of a house by the house. Well, the house isn't just a house. Well, the house is the guardian. There's another being in there, she said, walking back towards the house. The house didn't even try to hide its surprise. and Its anger was palpable. I turned a bit away, and the crowd scattered some as they all noticed the house's slight movements. Where are you going? I asked her. Oh, to kill it, she shouted back as she reached for the door. Kill what? I asked with genuine surprise. <laughs> the house, silly. Now, um, Abigail is different from us, but let's continue on, you'll see. Hey, um, before you go in there, can I ask? How do you kill a house? Abby responded. 
Well, um, kind of, yeah. I mean, the only two ways I know to kill a house is to wreck it or burn it down. And I shrugged, confusedly. Well, we won't be doing that to this house, Abby stated. She then stood in front of the house and looked at it and motioned me over. I take it you've seen a horror movie or two in your life? Abby asked, waiting for my answer. Yeah, I've seen a few. Why? Well, you know how at the end of the movie, and the heroes think they've triumphed, and the movie ends with either the house reforming later, or the monster laughs, or some silly shit like that? I nodded. Well, the first house I killed did that before I knew what to do to stop it. I went in, did what I had to, and then five years later it came back. Well, the only reason I even thought about it wasn't a missing persons report or a news article. Well, I was driving to the store one day and went to another part of town and, well, I saw the house again, she said, putting her hands on her hips. I spoke to people who'd been doing this longer than I had, and they called them rebounders. That's when a house is excised or destroyed, but the people who did the deed never do a full clean-up or follow-up, she told me. So, um, when you kill this house guardian thing, then what? We kill the bitch on the inside using the house to make a profit, Abby said, turning to Michelle and the cats. Dan, call your cop friends to lock this neighborhood down. We'll just make up a lie or whatever. This is Philly. I mean, there are gas leaks here all the time. Still confused, I did as she asked, and within 25 minutes we had the house cordoned off even further, and the neighborhood evacuated fully. I watched as Abby spoke to her little crew of, um... Not monster hunters? Well, when they were done, she came back to me. Dan, I need another favor from you, she said. What now? I asked in return. Can you get me five bucks from the ATM while I go back in? I can get ten. That's the minimum. Cool. Okay, go grab it real quick. I ran across the street and found the ATM and kept looking back the entire time. I didn't see Abigail anymore. Well, she must have gone back inside the house. I pulled out my card and hastily inserted it. I tried to hurry quickly when I heard the shattering of glass and the sound of something heavy hitting the ground. I turned, quickly placing my hand on the gun at my hip. There was a lazy boy on the ground and one of the front windows was shattered. I heard my money coming out as I saw pots, pans and a TV come flying out of the house from a variety of windows. Michelle, break the windows, I heard Abby yell from inside the place. The young woman picked up rocks and tossed them at the windows. A couple of the bay windows broke as she moved about desperately. I grabbed my money and ran back to the house. Well, the house seemed to grimace as each window shattered. And then Abby came flying out of the house again. Get out of my house, came a ghastly, scratchy female voice. I paused as that voice hit my very soul. It sounded wrong, so wrong. My skin crawled. Even the dogman thing didn't sound this bad. I could see the other cops shuddering, and we all kind of looked away from the house, not wanting to draw the attention of whatever was in there. I felt like a child being punished for something I hadn't done. Oh, fuck. Abby called out as she got up and ran back into the house. Abby, I called out. I noticed that the cat and Michelle hadn't moved from their positions, well, outside of trying to break the windows. The voice called out again. I think we all heard it this time, as it was louder and even more angered. Why must you bother me? What have I done to you? This is my neighborhood. The voice spoke. Not to us, but to Abigail. I assume Abigail must have been talking to her, but we just couldn't hear her. No, you will not. I've lived here for years. These people know me. A crash came again, and a squeal-like cry of pain. Leave it be, damn you, the voice cried. How dare! I heard as the wall exploded and the stove came out of it. Ah, take that, you bitch. I heard Abigail call right before she was shoved from the house again, but this time without as much force. She stood and climbed back inside. I moved to look at the wall's opening, and that's when I noticed that all of the furniture and items from the home were leaking, 
Even the things that shouldn't leak. No, not leaking. It was bleeding. Well, not blood, not like ours. But some oily ichor. It was coming from everything. I mean, everything she tossed out bled. I put on my gloves and felt the couch. It was soft, organic. Was this stuff alive? Was the Guardian an actual thing? She was killing the house, one organ at a time. I guess that what you put in your home made it a living thing. I mean, your pictures, your furniture, food, and even those you invite in. They all helped to make the house a living organism. But whatever was in this house was truly alive. Not metaphorically, but real. Stop! The cry came weak as Abigail ripped out its inside in the cool evening air. As the house seemed to lurch to the side, I could see the walls breaking and bending, allowing me to see inside. I could see what looked like tentacles writhing from the ceiling trying to hit Abigail. Two of the things tried to shout Abigail out as she held the walls, stopping their push. She turned to look outside for a split second. Dear God, she looked terrifying. Her eyes, that deep, fiery amber they were when she'd saved me. Well, they scared me then, and they scared me now. Her veins pulsing like lava beneath her skin, and now the smell of something cooking, and her hands glowing orange-red. She grimaced and pulled herself back in, as the tentacles flopped to the ground, seemingly dead. I hadn't noticed it before, but within the house, I could see her marks burned into the walls and the ceilings and the doors. Human whore, you've killed it. You've killed my home. My home. The voice came again. The house lurched to the side, and the cat moved back some and sat down and looked up. There came a crunch, an explosion of wood on the roof. I could see a figure on the roof now. Some of the other cops followed my gaze as I looked up. On that roof was a terrible horror. A woman hunched, tall, with scraggly clothes and sagging breasts. Her eyes were pinpoints of red. Her arms were long, too long for her body. And she moved slowly and wheezed. She reached back into the home and pulled out a large, bowl-like thing, complaining to herself, itself, the whole time. Crazy bitch, human bitch. You take my home, I take you. She plunged her arm inside the giant pot and swirled it around. A few of the cops pulled their firearms and aimed at the thing. No, wait. Let Abigail handle this. This is her call, I called out. They looked at me and then at each other. But they did lower their weapons. I had no idea how this thing would react. I mean, we were not Abigail. As the witch thing on the roof swirled, Abigail called from the second floor window as she climbed out onto the roof. Dan? I looked to see her eyes back to normal. Did you get the money? Um, yeah, I called back. Good. She smiled at me, climbing up to the upper roof like a damn spider. She went right after the giant pot and stuck her arm inside and then elbowed the witch creature. You will die. And they will die. She pointed down to us, and I shuddered as she looked my way. Nobody's going to die except you and this damn house, I heard Abigail call. Oh, I'm done here, done. Done with you, with them. The flash fire will consume this house and you. You've made a forever enemy in me, human. I'll come again. I'll take you home. Then you're alive. The witch growled as she poured some flaming liquid from her pot and slammed it onto the house. The house screamed as though wood could give voice to its anguish as the flames and liquid coated it. Ah, oh, shit, I heard Abigail call out as she jumped off the roof. The house screamed and died in mystical flames. It began to dissipate as though it was dissolving into its base parts. Abigail then smiled. And the house vanished in a puff of anguish and smoke, and the lot was empty of the house, and the witch thing had fled beneath the house as it collapsed in on itself. Well, you did it. Do I want to know what you were doing inside that house? Abby shook her head. We're not finished yet, she said quietly, 
as she pulled three sticks from behind her back. What's that? I asked, pointing at the bundles. She lifted the sticks, looking at me, and smiled. You and me, my good man. We're going to take a trip to hell. Do you still have that five bucks on you? I looked down, my hands shaking. I hadn't even noticed it. Then I pulled out the ten dollar bill. Oh, damn, look at you, rich boy. Abigail smiled, then placed the sticks on the ground, breaking them, forming a crude circle. Then another, and another, and another, and so on, until she had six. They looked like a planet with moons stretching into the distance. Confused still, I replied after a few moments. It's, um, ten bucks. You'll see, she said, wiping the gore from her arm, and the blood from her elbows. She mixed them, then tossed the wet stuff into the air. It landed in the first circle, then moved to the third one, then back to the first. Oh, thank goodness, Abigail said. Okay, buddy boy, time to go, she said to me, smearing my forehead with the foul-smelling gunk. Cat, you and Michelle stay here. Hopefully this won't... Well, I'll be back, eventually. But one thing I can say about you, Abigail, is that you make my dreams entertaining, Michelle said, clasping her shoulder. <laughs> Whatever. Abby said, shaking her head. She pulled me close, and then we jumped onto the impossibly small circle, and then... Thunder. So, um, yeah, that happened. You're going to be wondering why I haven't gone insane yet, and if this case is weird, what are the others going to be like? Well, listen on, my friend. My head rang as I rolled on the ground, trying to gather my thoughts. The sound of thunder filled my ears. Ah, oh, there was so much thunder, and it was loud, I mean, so loud. I could feel the pressure on my skin, and as the pressure from each boom pressed upon my chest, I moaned as my stomach revolted against today's lunch. I clutched at the dirt, struggling to open my eyes, and then I puked. The empty sensation made me feel better, but not by much, well, better. I also felt a wave of intense anger creeping over me. I don't know why, but it was so intense and seemed to rise with each passing moment. It was insidious, filling me like a tub filling with water. As I opened my eyes, I saw the subject of my ire. The intense red of my vision didn't help, and my teeth clenched as she looked at me and walked over. She knelt in front of me as I scowled at her. And then she slapped me. Oh! the hell was that for? I asked, noticing the anger subside, but my vision remaining red. Yeah, I know that look. It's the same look I had for a while when I was abandoned here. It creeps in and everything pisses you off. I mean, everything. But once you know that it's this place that makes you angry, it's hold less than somewhat, she told me, standing up and turning away from me. And, um, where is here? I asked then immediately grew quiet as the immensity of the situation hit me. That thunder was still booming. Oh dear God, where are we? I asked, as I realized it wasn't my vision that was red. Everything was tinged in reds, blacks, and greys. The environment itself, even the sky, was red. Then I noticed what inhabited the sky. Now, imagine if the moon wasn't millions of miles away, but maybe just one hundred... Then there was another moon, and another, and another, and so on. What the hell? A hell. One of many, and my former home, for a year at least, Abigail stated matter-of-factly, as she placed her hands on her hips. Then she turned to me, and that smile returned. Her eyes had that amber glow again. Welcome to Tartarus. Cassidy, or hell. Well, it's not Hades, though. No, not Hades. Hades is a lot grayer. Tartarus? Mythological Tartarus? I asked, bewildered. The anger resuming again. My eyes felt the pressure as it came again, but much more slowly, now that I was aware. Cop training was kicking in. Oh, Tartarus doesn't exist. It can't, I said as the thunder boomed. I mean, if this place exists, then... Dude. Abigail turned to look at me 
hands on hips and her head tilted to the side with twisted lips. My eyes glow. I saved you from a dog man, and you and your cop bodies just watched me kill a house. <laughs> a house. Then I pulled you into a pool of blood and we went straight to one of the hell dimensions. Well, I kind of just shrugged and apologized. I walked over to her and stood at her side and looked out over the place. Well, the best way to describe this place was well, like a bog. Well, what is a bog? A wetlands area. The ground is wet and soft with an accumulation of peat and other dead plant matter. I had a feeling this stuff below me was more than just dead plant matter. I was in hell. Why would the stuff here be made of the stuff from Earth? Abigail, what's this stuff made of? It looks like a bog with trees and stuff. I began before she interrupted me. Well, that's because it is a bog with trees and stuff, she said with that Abigail smirk. I noticed her eyes hadn't stopped glowing since we'd been here. I wanted to ask, but she'd most likely give me a smart-ass remark or something. I knew she took this stuff seriously, but there always seemed to be mirth and merriment in the way she went about things. I've never seen her type in a film before, that's for certain. Watch your feet, Dan. This muck will suck you in quick if you're not paying attention. Also watch the skies and your back, and the ground and the trees, she told me. And I thought about what she'd say. It'd be something like, Oh, because you're in hell, Dan. We walked for a bit as we moved away from anything that remotely looked like liquid. She said during her time here, whenever she drank the stinking mess, she'd make a cup, run down and grab some, then run away. She said she'd almost been pulled under once, but she burned the thing's tentacles off. As we passed a dark pool of liquid, I swore I could see something beneath glaring at me. I saw there were multiple sets of shiny black eyes beneath the water. I reached forward to grab Abigail and warn her. Just keep walking, Dan. If they leave the water, we run, you hear me? I nodded as we picked up the pace. A few minutes later, we cleared a large section of trees and I asked her why there were no sounds outside of water slapping the ground now and then. No birds, insects, or even devilish things. She told me that nothing here wanted to be eaten by anything else. Hell had ecology just like every other world. I nodded to Pierce. Well, even though I could breathe, it was like taking in a lungful of rotten eggs with each breath. We reached an outcropping of stones, and Abigail peered over into the distance of the hellscape. Jagged outcroppings of hills and deep valleys lay before me. It was kind of like standing at the top of a large hill and looking out into a valley. But in that valley you could see smoke rising from various places, like from a house or a hut. There were the eerie sounds of beasts better left unseen and unmet, and the skies came alive as a large winged thing flew above at a distance. Abigail, look, I know this is your thing, but how are we supposed to find her in all of this? Bogs, woods, hills, no trail in sight, I asked curiously. Haven't you noticed my eyes since we've been here? She prodded. Yeah, I did. Well, I'm following her the way people who roam places like this follow each other and other things. Her hellish stink is peculiar to her, and I've bound both me and you to that stench. It's not a smell, but, well, her aura. She passed by here not more than a day ago. That was a day ago? Well, you just jumped through that pool thing well, not more than five hours ago. And then I answered the question myself, seemingly catching on. So, um, time moves a bit differently here, then. Abigail nodded and then added, The way this works is that you only ever use maps in a place like this once you're inside a building or a structure, cause, because those don't change unless the barmy inside said structure can change it on a whim. We walked over to a clearing and she grabbed a stick and then drew a square on the ground and random shapes to represent places. Okay, this is us, she said, pointing to two stick figures. This is the home of Duchess Serafina, the vile Duchess of Death, or some shit. And for whatever dumb reason, you have business with her. You walk in this direction and think of her. You'll get there. If you get turned around and wind up walking back the way you came, but she's in your thoughts, you'll still get there. Distance doesn't matter in places like this. If you want to get somewhere, you'll get there. I think I understood somewhat now. 
In a place like this, you have to throw out what you know and just accept things the way they are, and try to influence it in some way to your benefit. I smiled and nodded at her. I used to be a scout, so travelling and learning things about it wasn't very difficult. See those twin spires over there in the far distance? It was hard to make out anything in this red haze, but she used to live here, so it's something she's used to. Yeah, I see it. Well, that's where she's headed. We can beat her there as long as you have that money still. I do, but it's just ten bucks. I mean, what's the big deal about it? Come on, there's a river not far from here, and it'll take us to those spires. It was about an hour of sneaking and moving about slowly and quietly to avoid being seen by the creatures here. We did run into another human woman, but she wasn't in the mood to chat. I didn't want to chat anyway. I mean, she had no eyes, but I could tell she was still watching us. Abigail forbid me to even think about speaking to anything here. Speak to nothing here. Let me do the talking. Whether it's alive or dead, you can't trust anything from this place, you hear me? She said, with all seriousness. Abigail was equipped to handle a place like this, and I wasn't. But it didn't stop me from saying something stupid. Look, you're from here, I said, regretting it immediately. I'm from southwest Philly, Dan. I just got stuck here for a bit, she said, with no sign of hurt or pain from my words. Well, this was her business. People probably said stupid things to her all the time. We arrived at the side of the stinking thing, and all about us was a sound of wailing and sorrow. I could sense deep anguish overriding the anger that was still in me from this place. I looked about and noticed that Abigail walked out in plain sight, as I almost wet myself from the sight before me. There was a gathering of creatures most foul to human senses. Two beings stood between us and the river, and in between those two beings was what appeared to be a humanoid of features I could not make out. The flesh was model green, and his chin sagged. The bottom of his body was torn and ragged, flowing off into nothingness. He looked at us, and then bowed his head down again in shame. Above his head was a mark of some kind. One of the creatures was etching it on his head. Wisps of smoke and steam hissed from its touch. It was some form of living shadow thing, impossibly thin, with a skeletal horned head and bat-like wings in smoke-filled tatters behind it. I knew if this creature was in a room with you, you'd never see it before it was too late to do anything. And the other creature was a fat thing, in fineries remnant from some medieval hell. And the colours of its clothing were not so different from that of a feudal noble, but the grotesque thing that wore them was another thing to behold. It wore no shoes on the greasy-looking elephant-like feet it had. Its head resembled that of a frog and a lizard that had had sex with a pterodactyl, with the wings on it looking as if they'd arisen from the back and shoulders at the same time. I knew this place was off, but I had to resist every singular urge to run as fast and as far away as I could. I guess Abigail had noticed, as she slapped the shit out of me. Stay here. Those two things would cause you to have a very bad day. Well, we're lucky they're in the midst of a transaction, because if they wanted, one of them would snatch you while I dealt with the other, and you'd be that guy they're trading. I said nothing, only nodded. The urge to wet myself returned, and I turned to pee on the ground while making sure nothing else wanted me. I could hear Abigail talking to the fat one as the shadow thing had adjusted itself to stare at me. The fear I felt then was too much. Oh, it radiated cold and evil and it hated me. But the way it had held the other man, I knew it would not slay me, at least not right away. That other man was dead, and I wasn't. If this was a transaction, then a living being would probably net a lot more than that pitiful creature it held. As angry and fearful as I was right now, I trusted her to know best. Not long after her moments of chatter with the things, they moved on and Abigail returned, pulling me by the upper arm. I could only stare at the things as the man was given to the fat thing and the shadow monster bowed and took flight, glaring at me as it vanished into nothingness, its captives wailing mixed with those of the spirits around us. What were those things? What the hell were those? I asked, shaken to the core. I felt as if my mind would shatter at the revelation of the existence of such things. 
even though I'd watched her kill a house and fight a fairy tale night hag in Philly. Well, the fat thing was a kebula, and the other thing was a shadow demon. The guy in the middle was a purchase. We interrupted their business. I asked for passage to the edge of the water in return for something, she told me. Um, something like what? I asked, checking the skies and the shadows around me. I'll give it a vial of the hag's blood. They could use it if I decided to let her live, she said. She said it very casually, too. Look, Dan, this is a hell dimension. There's not a lot of good here. Good comes and goes on various missions of mercy and such, but this is hell. I nodded in despair as I realized that I truly was in a world not my own. Now, the good thing, Dan, is that the human mind is very resilient. If you spent another month here and learned to survive, these things would still be scary, but become commonplace. Well, you get used to it. That's the gift our species has. Once we survive a thing and see it enough, we grow numb to it. She sat on the shore of a river, near some sort of man or monster made dock for some time. She cautioned me that this was the river Letha. Its waters would make you forget everything the longer you were exposed to it. A splash could make you forget the last few minutes. A dunk could make you forget the last few hours. An immersion, well, let's not go there. We talked more as we waited. She told me of the many places she'd been to, and things she'd seen or thought. She always laughed when she told me of the various times she got her ass handed to her. Says it's one of the reasons she doesn't kill everything we consider supernatural. She said there are populations of monsters that had their methods of survival, just as we had ours. And to us, a moral thing might not be the same as a moral thing to them. And the goal was to stop those that caused harm for no other reason than to do it. Not slaughter something we don't understand unless it was a threat. Ah, oh, finally, she said, standing looking into the distance. I stood and turned to look at an old wooden boat that at once seemed incredibly slow, but had also reached us with incredible speed. Is that who I think it is? I asked her. That's only one of who you think it is. Sharon the ferryman is like a holy figure to them. The ferrymen are a full species with mastery of the river Letha. This is their home. This is where they conduct business. And this is how you traverse all the hells and even a couple of the nicer places. The ferryman was a hooded and robed figure whose outfit was a flowing, tattered, dark grey thing. His skeletal face frightened me, but not to the extent the fat thing and the shadow thing had. I sensed evil, but no malice. From what Abigail told me, these things were professionals first. You stated where you wanted to go and paid them. It was a simple thing. Greetings, travelers. Where do you wish to go? It said as if the air just flowed through the teeth, forming the words with them moving. To the court of the two spires, Abigail said. My fee is two gold pennies, it began, when Abigail motioned me forward. Give him the ten, Dan, and watch, she said. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the ten dollar bill. When I looked at it, I'd expected to see Hamilton's face as I unfolded the paper money to give to the ferryman. What the hell? I said, looking in shock at a picture of Abe Lincoln. The date of production said March 1861. That's a demand note, Dan. The first real widely accepted paper money of the U.S., the ferrymen love this more than they love gold pennies. Because of the sheer amount of souls they got to ferry about the plains during the Civil War in such a short amount of time, well, it's a historical event for them. I handed the creature the money and watched it come to life then. Abraham Lincoln, it said, adding, This was a fine time to be a ferryman. So much profit was made then. Oh, it was a great four years on one landmass. He seemed pleased with the payment, holding it aloft as it vanished into nothingness. I'll give expedient service for you. Let us be off to the court of the two spires, it said as we left the dock at a clip. Of all the things that can have good dealings in hell, well, they're the ferrymen. Just pay them and you're good. Give them something special and you'll be remembered. Well, there are still some evil SOBs, just don't cross them and you're protected while you travel with them, she said. Well then, to the court of the two spires. Right, I just need you to pause here for a moment. 
I'm not crazy. You're not crazy. I just learned, 100%, that we most definitely are not alone. There's more to life than humanity out there. Out where? <laughs> Everywhere. Some of it's not nice. So, let's welcome you to the Two Spires. Ah, the trip through hell. A hell. Was weird. For all of my dread, and believe me, there was a lot of that, I felt like an explorer. I felt like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. I knew I could die at any moment, but this was exhilarating. This particular hell is not like the hells you read or hear about. There was no mass gnashing of teeth. No demons were screaming, just to scream for screaming's sake. You could hear the sounds of the area like the winds and the water flowing, but the ferryman himself was as silent as death itself. And the way it looked, he was like death itself. We could see the spires in the distance. They seemed so far away. But as Abigail told me, distance didn't matter here or anywhere on most planes. As we sailed, the oddest thought came to me. Hey, Abby, I said as she turned to look at me. She looked so damn strong standing on the prow. She looked as if she were leading the charge of the light brigade. Yeah? She replied. Let's say you were in a movie. Like the one where the girl comes out of the TV, or the one where the girl croaks a lot and possesses that house in Japan. Could you beat them? I asked, genuinely curious. Nope, she replied, not looking back. But I could tell she was smiling. Really? I said in return, shocked at the admission. Well, I'd erase them. I'd erase them out of existence, she said, turning to face me. In my line of work... There are things I can beat, but they just keep coming back to cause more harm. Other things, while physical in some ways, are mental in others, she said, sitting down. There are things I have to let exist, regardless of what happens to them or us. I have no idea who made this up, but I can sense that's how it's supposed to be. Well, those two in those films are what's known as mimetic. They'll exist as long as people think of and remember them. Well, I've told you before that I can mark, protect, record, and erase things. Well, when I erase something, it's just gone, she said, making the poof motion. Do you know where they go to when they're erased? I asked. Nope, I don't care to either. I despise mimetic. A mimetic is a shitty thing that haunts places like Reddit and emails. A mimetic exists as long as people think they do. They get in people's heads, and they make them go insane. Well, werewolves and dogmen eat people, but they generally don't do that. Skinwalkers are just assholes that like to scare folk, unless they have a vendetta. But a mimetic is worse. They don't even kill for profit. They just do it because they can. I could see her growing angry now as she spoke of them. I hate bullies, Dan. And mimetics are bullies. Fuck them. She said, turning away. Well, I left alone, and for a moment forgotten how this place enhances anger. I guess even she wasn't immune, even after having lived here for so long. As we came around a bend, the court of the two spires came into view as we closed upon them. Well, ten minutes ago, they'd seemed like they were twenty miles away, and in the turn of the bend of the letter, it was only about three city blocks away. Well, all the fear came back to me then, when I could make out what the gigantic things were in reality. The spires were the skeletal remains of two enormous humanoid entities. One of the things looked inhuman, with skeletal wings jutting out of the back, its body merged into the rock face as evil things flitted about it. All manner of demon, fiend and devil were milling about. I had no wish to enter or even go near the place. I regretted coming here. I'd have nightmares about this forever. Well, that's if my mind doesn't snap under the strain. If other humans or human-like beings dealt with these things frequently, well, I have to ask, how? How is it possible? And Abby did say that the more you dealt with this, the easier on the mind it became. I don't know if I believed her. But I saw her do something insane. She pulled out her phone, holding it like she was taking pictures. She was taking pictures. She motioned me over. I am not posing for a selfie in hell, I began. I'm not getting off this ferry with all those things about. We have to. 
We only paid for this trip, she shrugged. But you'll be known forever to the ferryman as one of the better passengers, if that helps. The fare is ended. Our business is done. Please exit the boat. I have another fare waiting. Thank you for your business, Dan Josephson of Philadelphia. It said as it nodded its bony head to me. So we exited the craft and stood upon the dock. I watched as the ferry left, wishing I'd had another five or ten on me. I'll make sure in future to always keep a spare, just in case. As I stood looking at the other spy, it was more human-looking in nature. But it wasn't a human head atop the skeleton. It had a large ibis-like head attached. The things near this one were more grounded. There were no flying things about it. Every grotesque monstrosity here walked or hovered. Some slithered, leaving behind slimy gore trails, and others stood about chatting as if this was normal. I guess this was normal for them, but not for me. Why did we come here, Abby? What was the purpose? I thought we were chasing the hag, I asked, not wanting to move another inch. Well, this is where she came, she replied. Why? I thought she wanted you dead. She does, but that's the thing about hacks. They love to make deals and break them. When things don't go their way, they seek out the contractor who made her a deal, and then allowed an asshole like me to screw it up. So, um, what's the goal? There's no way even you could kill or fight through all of these mockeries of life, I retorted. One thing you'll learn when you travel as I do is that you can't murder Hobo to make your way through reality to get ahead. That only works for a while, until it doesn't. Okay, then. Um, what's the plan? We make a counteroffer, she said, pointing ahead. I turned to see what she was pointing at. It was the hag. That hellish creature she fought on the roof of the house. She stood at the foot of the giant skeletal structure watching us as we passed by the creatures of hell. And there was literally no point in watching my back. Everywhere I looked was a thing from nightmare. There were things here that could kill me and eat my soul in an instant. I'd probably never sleep well again, and, and I'd go broke with all the mental help I'd be needing after all this. A dogman, singular, was one thing. To learn of dogmen as a population was something else. Well, anyway, we moved toward the red-eyed bitch that had caused me to be here. She stood smiling at a too-wide grin. I got a real good look at her, and it was like something from a movie. She was ultra-thin and bony. She stood knock-kneed and hunched over. Her bare grey mottled breasts hung like another set of arms. And she wore jewellery, and I used that in the loosest terms possible, made of teeth, bones, and skulls over the red, tattered clothing about her. Her hair was greasy and black, with a white streak up the middle between the horns on her head. Well, well, it took you long enough to find me, Hunter. She said, rubbing her hands together. I didn't think you'd show up on Car City. I find it pleasant myself, and what about you, little human meat? Too far from home for you. She pointed a bony hand toward me, and I instinctively moved a bit behind Abigail. She stepped in between me and it. If I'm here, Hag, then you know I'm not a hunter. The humans who travel the plains are not like Dan. You know full well Earth humans are a different breed entirely. The way Abigail had said it, as if our species, I guess my species, were somehow lesser, and those other types of humans had dealings with these planes, well, I admit I felt like a lesser person at that observation. The world we'd come from was just a hunting ground for these creatures. We weren't much to even consider outside of meat and harvesting. We were food to the beasts of the night, and even our best, the hunters of these things, had never come here, at least not like Abigail does. I used to live here, Hag. Carcery stinks, and so do you, Abigail stated, adding, Now shall we proceed about our business, so I can leave this cesspool? I noticed some of the creatures close by turn and snicker when she said that, but Abigail stood firm. Yes, you house-killing bitch. The hag retorted. I must admit, I was at a loss as to what the hell was going on. I thought we came here to kill her, I asked in a whisper. Abigail bent toward me as we walked into a hall of bone, 
and I gagged as we neared a fountain that steamed with an acidic stench. Well, we did, but once I figured out where she was going, a new plan came to mind. I knew what she was planning by coming here, she said to me. And what was that? Well, she's taken me to the small claims court. I killed her house, and she knew she couldn't kill me, so she'd return to the thing that gave her a place to ply her trade on earth. She would plead that her bargain, whatever it is, was not fulfilled due to your presence and then calling me. Wait, so if I hadn't called you, we wouldn't even be here? I asked. Well, probably not you, but I would have eventually found the house and killed it anyway. You said she couldn't kill you. Why not? I know you're different than I am, but are you immortal or something? I asked. No, I can be killed, but things like her bargaining souls, and I'm really hard to kill. My soul is currently promised to three other beings. Even if I die before they do, they'd have to squabble over the bits of my soul, but the things that made me will not let go so easily. You'll see, Abigail said as I stopped walking to consider her words. Come, wait, the hag motioned. I haven't all day to deal with your time. As we made our way up the staircase of bleached bones, the hag kept looking back at me as if I was some prize to be won. It was like I was worth all the gold in the world. But I realized I wasn't. From everything I've experienced today, a single human soul isn't worth much outside of being turned into a foot soldier in some red war that Abigail told me about. The war between the monsters of all the hells, while the celestials watched and guarded. Oh, shit. Why are you here, Dan? I asked myself. We made it to an open-air room on the third or fourth rib of the thing. As we walked toward the door, we were greeted by a burly dog-faced thing in gleaming armor and carrying a polished golden spear thing. Stage your business, it growled at us, and the hag moved forward. I would have words with your master, beast. Inform it that Tagrithin of Gehenna has come to file a complaint. And you? It asked of Abigail. I'm the thing she's going to file a complaint about. I'm Abigail Mitchell of Earth. Well, it sniffed Abigail as if it was looking for something else. I sense Carcerion you also, it stated. Bring your human and enter. The dog thing didn't even look in my direction. Inside it was more a courtroom with creatures of ill intent, standing on the sides as they all sought audience with the master. Well, I must say it was a very orderly affair. It was terrifying, but orderly. To the side, to the side, the dog guard thing barked, pushing aside other monsters. You shall kneel before the lord of this place, Mat Nio, the ruler of Klim. Well, everyone knelt, as did I. You do not want to stand out in a place like this. Ah, Tagrithin, came a voice from behind a large table covered in what looked like flesh torn from something large. Why do I smell the scent of failure on you, hag? Why have you come here? Matnior said in a monotone voice. I had no wish to see a hell lord, but I opened my eyes and looked forward as the high back chair turned about. I actually smirked for a quick moment, rather than appear frightened, and the elbow Abigail gave me made me stop immediately. The thing that had wrought so much terror from the things in the room, and even commanded Abigail's respect, looked like a fleshy version of a bubble blower and a stick figure. But even I could see that its body was powerfully corded and ripped, and those hands held dangerous clothes. The head of it was head-shaped, but there was a massive hole where the face should be and just ears on the sides of the head. It was a gaping moor of darkness. And why did you bring that with you? It said, pointing at Abigail. Abigail stood quiet and said nothing. I despise the remade ones. They're nothing but trouble, exceedingly hard to remove stains of the universe. Years ago, we made the pact, you and I, Though you'd furnish me with a key to leave this prison plane in return for my services on Earth in a nation of my choosing, and the habitat in which to live, you promised that humans would only be able to contest me after seven upon seven years. 
Well, this year is year 13, and yet this human, she said, pointing to Abigail, has destroyed the home you provided, and I can no longer send you the souls to which you can bargain with. That is true, Hag. No human has contested you, it said. Well, this human has. I claim its life for you and its soul to be used as you please, the Hag said, pointing at me. Come forward, meat. Speak and be aware that this hole for a head can sense deception, for Orthris is a plain of liars and traitors after death, it said as I gritted my teeth and carefully moved from behind Abigail. Your Lordship, I am Dan Josephson, and I noticed that the house this woman had used for nefarious purposes, and I am much like the guard dog. I heard it growl behind me as I said it. Um, well, your guard here. I'm a cop, and I have to alert my superiors of crimes being committed. A police officer. How noble. How quaint. How truthful. It stated before continuing. So, police officer, the hag says you were the cause of her troubles on the 13th year. How do you plead? Um, well, not guilty, I said, shutting one eye. Hag, the human speaks the truth. No human has contested you in seven upon seven years, the bubblehead said. Then what do you call that? The hag said, pointing at Abigail. He summoned her. She destroyed my property. Property I was using in your service. Well, she was even angrier than before. She huffed but made no motion to attack Abigail. Is this true, police officer Dan? Did you summon this remade to destroy property not belonging to you? Matanyor asked, folding his fingers together. I uh, don't know what summoning is, sir. I just called Abigail because she's dealt with things like this before. I swear that's all I did. I yammered, the bottom falling out in my gut as panic threatened to set in. I looked at Abigail for comfort and saw that mirth in her eyes again. What was she planning? I have no wish to speak to a remade one. You and your kind are a pox on reality, but I am aware of your nature, if not the full extent of your power. But speak to you I must. The human meat has spoken no falsehoods, and you are not fully human anymore. Thus the hag's protests have no merit, Matnior began. She will pay the soul she owes for the remainder of her terms, or her eternity shall be spent as a worm, groveling for stature in the wet war's shit bits. But since you have demolished her home, she will be punished now, as she has nowhere to return to, and I will not give a second key from Carceri. Even the Titans have no such claim. Abigail stepped forward. Then, may I propose a counteroffer, good Matneo? Mm, I sense bedevilment in you, girl. What are you on about? Well, I love Philadelphia and wish to see it improve. You can do so with the hag's help and strict compliance to rules I would blood oath her to follow on pain of eternal death here and now. And she'd also be in place to fulfill your pact for not only this year, but for seven upon seven and seven upon seven more. I looked at Abigail in stunned amazement. What the hell has she been thinking? Why would she want to bring such a creature back to Earth? I knew there was nothing I could do to stop her. Maybe this was all a trick and she couldn't be trusted after all. I bowed my head and that's all I remember from that point until I got back to Earth. I don't even remember how we returned. I do remember waking up at home with a terrible headache and the feelings of anger slowly leaving my body. I vaguely remember some of the creatures I saw there. Not specific details, but vagaries. I remember the hag and the house with full clarity, the ride on the river Lethe, and the demonic courtroom, but not much of what occurred. I remember being questioned and being told I was being truthful, and I remember the hag being upset and Abigail not saying much. After a few hours of further napping and eating, I gave Abigail a call. She told me she'd be over after a while. She said she had to check in on somebody first. When she arrived, I sat down with her. I had to know what happened after I'd blacked out and wound up back home. Why it was so hard for me to remember anything else. 
She pulled out her cell phone and showed me pictures from that place that I'd have had a hard time wanting to remember. And then she pulled out a small vial of murky liquid. What's that? I asked. It's water from the river Lethe. I took some to use on you because you're a friend and I don't want you suffering through those images every time you closed your eyes. Normal earth humans are not ready for that yet. This is more in case you want to forget everything up to yesterday. But each sip is five hours, she told me, giving me the vial. I held it in my hand and looked at it. I'd just napped with no problems at all. Did she take out the really bad stuff? Well, I guess it worked first on those memories more harmful to the mind, leaving the less dangerous ones somewhat intact, if vague. So, what happened then? What happened with the hag? Were we successful in killing her? I asked, wanting to know if I'd done something badass or not. Abigail told me the whole thing, about us meeting her pack giver, and Abigail being taken to the hell version of Small Claims Court. How Abigail made a new deal to bring the hag back to Philly. <laughs> you did what? I yelled, eyes wide. I made a new deal. I did it not only to help the city, but to clean it up from some of the corruption. How so? I asked with genuine curiosity. The hag will be made a councilwoman. Her job will be to keep track of contracts that are used to harm rather than help the people of Philadelphia. She'll deal with them in her way, and only get my ire if she doesn't follow the many rules I set forth for her. So we have an evil, otherworldly hag serving on the city council to help the city, and deal with those that harm the city. Who is she? <laughs> Can't tell you that. She said, shrugging. That's part of the deal. So will the hag still steal people's souls and send them back to that Kasseri place? Well, only certain people now, and she'll have a limit of three per year, as agreed by the terms of the blood oath, she said. So, um, well, our noble effort to enter hell wound up with the bad guy getting a job on the city council, huh? Yep. No, slay the evil witch to save the people, huh? Nope. Well, she'd go on to fill in the parts I couldn't remember and leave out the details of some more horrific things. She did tell me I'd make a good hunter one day, though. That was what she was training Michelle to be. When I asked her about the blood oath and what that entailed, she told me the hag's soul would be unable to be used as payment or punishment until their pact was done. And she added that no other being could lay claim to her soul while the pact was in place. I told her that in her line of work, I guessed it was a good thing to have this kind of curse, when no one could lay claim to your spirit. She then told me something that made my eyes go wide. She told me she wasn't worried, either way. I asked her why. Because, <laughs> silly, I have twenty-one curses on me already, she said, smiling that Abigail smile. And there you have it, folks. The reason I'm not insane. Well, according to Abigail, the more you see these things, the more your brain rewrites itself. It also helped that she was around to slap the hell out of me when I felt a little off. The little vial I have of the otherworldly river water helped me forget some things, but the pictures she took on that damn phone remind me that it did happen. Well, that's it for now. One day I'll tell you about the Dogman, or that time in Upper Derby. Oh, God, Upper Derby. Oh my god, it was a hot one here today. 30 plus degrees centigrade, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Whew. I tell you, the office was um, not smelling too good today where I record this story. And I've got my mate, Mr. Kitten, here with me. Are you right, mate? Oh, he's a hot, hot cat today. He's doing the best thing. He's trying to sleep his way through it, aren't you, mate? Yes, you are. Okay. Well, um, intriguing story there. That's been sitting on my desktop for more than a year been meaning to get around to it and I finally have done so. What did you think? Did you enjoy that one? If so, then please um, give the author some encouragement because um, more to come maybe. I certainly hope so. Well, oh, enough for one day. I am dying of the heat here. Need to get out of this room and, well, go and have a beer to be honest with you. <laughs> Until um, tomorrow. Podcast coming out tomorrow. Till then, very, very sweet dreams.
สบายบาย